know the Lord will make a way. Yes, he will. Come on, say it right, you mean it. Oh, yes, he will. I wish I had a witness. Yes, he will. I'm not talking about what somebody told me. Hey, yes, he will. Oh, I know he will. I've tried him for myself. I know the Lord will make a way. Yes, he will. Sometimes I'm right. Sometimes I'm wrong. Still I'm hoping God will make me strong. We'll make a way. Come on, let's come to this time of intercession and prayer. If you need the Lord to make a way, come on right now. Yes, he will. God still hears and answers prayer. Yes, he will. Somebody here needs him in a real way. Oh, yes, he will. I tried him and I know he will. I know the Lord will make a way. Yes, he will. He'll make a way for me and you. God will see you safely through I know the Lord God our Father this morning our testimony is you'll make a way somebody here needs a way to be made They've been struggling all last week and just couldn't wait to make it here this morning to hear the testimony of the saints that when a door needs to be opened, when a tear needs to be dried, when, when a prayer needs to be answered, we have some place to hide. We have some place to run and we have shelter in our storm because we know God will make a way. We come this morning, our Father, to give you our best hallelujah, our loudest praise, our humble thanks for all that you've already done. Thank you for goodness and mercy that keeps on chasing us and following us all the days of our lives. We come, our Father, because we remember when we didn't have a God on our side, you still helped us. You were still strength for us. When we didn't even know you, you were still blessing us. And we want to give you praise and thanks right now. Thank you for keeping us through divorce and keeping us through sickness. Keeping us through trials and misunderstandings. Keeping us through death and sorrow. Keeping us through loss of jobs and keeping us when our income was low. Keeping us when our friends were few keeping us when mama and daddy was gone, keeping us when it looked like night would never end. God, you just kept a fence around us. We praise your name this morning because we never would have made it had it not been for your grace. Then our Father, we come to confess that we have sinned and come short of your glory. We sinned in word and in deed. We thank you, O oh God, that you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Have mercy on us according to your loving kindness. 
according to the multitude of your tender mercy, blot out all our transgression. We need you, O oh God, because we have hurt somebody's feelings. We've walked contrary to your way. We've been misunderstood and somebody might have fallen out with the church because of our bad example. But we pray, oh God, that you forgive us, restore us, refresh us, that we might worship you in a manner that is worthy of who you are. We come praying for our brothers and sisters whose hand we hold. We don't know what their struggle is. We don't know what their doctor's report has said. We don't know what str struggle is going on in their lives, but we know that you're able to fix it. You're able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can even ask or think. We come, oh God, because your word says there's no good thing that you will withhold from them who walk uprightly. So we come to commit our ways, to commit our problems, to commit our situations, all of it, we put it in your hand. Bless the word preached this morning. Lift the word this morning that somebody who's stumbling in sin or somebody who's looking for a savior, looking for a church home would come running crying, what must I do? Then, oh God, one day soon, the warfare will be over. Some of us here are getting old and our steps are getting short. Soon we will be done with the troubles of this world. When that morning comes, when that evening comes, we want to hear your voice saying, Servant, well done. You've been faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many. You know what we need even before we ask. You know even better than we know ourselves. So hear our prayer. Incline your ear to us and grant us your peace. In the strong name of he who loves our souls, even Jesus Christ. Amen. Open your Bibles with me to chapter 25 of the book of Genesis. This is the last in our series of sermons on Abraham's life. I'm going to miss Abraham. We've been talking about him now for some 17 weeks or more. And I want to look at chapter 25, commencing in verse 5 through verse number 11. And Abraham gave all that he had unto Isaac, but unto the sons of the concubines which Abraham had, Abraham gave gifts and sent them away from Isaac his son while he yet lived eastward unto the east country. And these are the days of the years of Abraham's life which he lived, a hundred Three score and fifteen years, or one hundred and seventy-five years. Then Abraham gave up the ghost and died in a good old age, an old man and full of years, and was gathered to his people. And his sons Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave of Machpelah in the field of Ephraim, the son of Zohar, the Hittite, which is before Mamre. The field which Abraham purchased of the sons of Heth, there was Abraham buried and Sarah his wife. And it came to pass after the death of Abraham that God blessed his son Isaac, and Isaac dwelt by the well Lehiroi. Thank you. You may be seated. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Walking with God by faith. Walking with God by faith. Over these weeks, we have looked at Abraham being called from the land of Ur of the Chaldees. He was called out from among his, his kinsfolk and his acquaintances. And he was called to go to a land that he knew nothing of. He was taken away from everything that was familiar to him. 
his father, his land, his, his, his culture, everything that, that made him who he was, God called him from that to bring him to another land. And the scripture says that God blessed Abraham. And he chose that through Abraham, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. God blessed Abraham to marry a beautiful woman by the name of Sarah. But Sarah, as you know, was barren and could not bear him children. And Abraham and Sarah go to Egypt and uh, he sins there in Egypt because he has Sarah to lie and say that she is his sister rather than his wife because he does not want to be killed by the Egyptians and Sarah taken from him. It's in that moment of weakness and failure that he lies and sins, but God still keeps them because God has made a promise that all the nations of the earth through Abraham would be blessed. Success and failure, ups and downs, trials and tribulations, sunshine and rain, good days and bad days, life is filled with all of them. Life is a mixture of success and failure, up and down, good and bad, sunshine and rain, and if you're not careful, you'll put too much trust in one and not enough trust in the other. Or you will believe that you will be successful all the time if you're succeeding. Or you will believe that you will fail all the time if you're failing. But I need you to hear me this morning, brothers and sisters. Success and failure are both imposters. Uh, because you can get caught up in one and think that you're going to be one of them all your life, but sometimes God has to let us fail to make us recognize that you've got to totally trust in God. I wish I had a witness here. I need somebody here who knows something about success and failure. Up and down. Good and bad. Right and wrong. You've had all of them in your life, but through it all, God's kept you. God's been faithful. God has showed up when you needed him. God has been the God that he said he would be in your success and your failure. Here is Abraham. God has finally delivered on his promise. He's given him a son after his mistake with Hagar. God has given him a son, Isaac, and then God tells him, take your only son, your uniquely born son, your son of your old age, and sacrifice him on a mountain that I will show you. Abraham saddles his ass and gets all of his servants together, and they head up to Mount Moriah, and he says to the servants, wait here while me and the boy go yonder to worship. He's on his way to take Isaac's life, but he calls it, an act of worship. And until you are willing to lay your Isaac down, you're not willing to give God the worship he deserves. Unless God has first place in your life, unless God is your priority, unless what you love you put on the altar of sacrifice for God, you're not really willing to worship God in the manner that he deserves to be worshipped. He's on his way to lay Isaac down. And while he's on his way up one side of the mountain with questions, God is coming up the other side of the mountain with the answer. Uh, they're on their way. And Isaac says, Daddy, I see the wood. I see the fire. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham says, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for the burnt offering. And when they get up there, he's ready to come down with his knife and God says, Abraham, now I know that you fear God. Look behind you, there's a ram caught in the thicket and he sacrifices that ram and the ram becomes an intercessor. The ram becomes a type of Christ. 
He sacrifices him and on that mountain he calls God by a new name. Jehovah Jireh. The God who will provide. And somebody here has had your own personal Mount Moriah. Somebody here has had to walk up to God with some questions. But while you were coming to God with questions, God was coming to you with the answer. God will provide. I wish I had a witness here. Whatever you're in need of, God will provide. Whatever you don't understand, God will provide. And God will not always provide an answer. God wants to be the answer. Stop looking always for an answer. God wants to be the answer. Because what you need is not a new car. You need God. You don't need new friends, you need God. You don't need a new job, you need God. Because if you have God, everything you need, God will provide. Abraham knows that God is able to provide. He buries Sarah in chapter number 24. Sarah is buried, she's old and full of years. And she dies at 127 years old. He buries her. The Bible says he weeps and he mourns for Sarah. And when the time of weeping and mourning is over, he stands up and sacrifices and gives thanks unto God. But all that God has brought him through, all the ways that God has made from God, God has made him rich. God has made him prosperous. God has given him military might. God has given him wealth and livestock and camels and health and long life. Everything he has ever needed, God has been faithful to provide. And now Abraham comes to the end of his life, 175 years old. And the Bible says he's getting ready to die and, and I almost skipped over this part until the Holy Spirit brought it back to my remembrance. He gave Isaac what he wanted him to have while he was alive. He gave Isaac what he wanted him to have while he was alive. Because he had some other children with a wife after Sarah died. And then he had that boy with Hagar, Ishmael. He had some outside children. Uh, they look like him. Uh, if you feed them long enough, they start looking like him. They were his, he had them, but Isaac was the promise. Through Isaac, all the nations of the earth would be blessed, and Abraham, in dying, did not want any confusion. Because if you want to see a mess get started, you die with no directives no will structure in place no last will and testament and brothers and sisters stop speaking to each other somebody will help me talk here family members will hate each other over a bed spread Mama wanted me to have that. They will quit speaking to each other over eight hundred dollars. Cause Papa was a Rolling Stone. Wherever he laid his hat was his home. And when he died, all he left you was alone. L-O-A-N 
Somebody ought to help me preach it. You know how black folk do. Get all of that straight while you are alive so it don't be no cutting when you're dead. And, and, and people at the funeral glare. Listen, you, you might think I'm making this up, but there have been funerals here at Lily Grove where I have had to have security inside the funeral. Because brothers and sisters don't want to sit with each other and they promise they're going to fight at the funeral. I said, and, and, I, and I've had to go in the back vestibule. You just, just ask some of the deacons who hang around here. I've had to go in the back vestibule and say, now listen, family. We're going to have this funeral for one hour. Now, after the funeral is over, you can fight in the parking lot. <laughs> after we dismiss this body and put it in the hearse, you can rumble on the street. But long as we're in this sanctuary... It ain't going to be no drama. Everybody going to love everybody. Everybody going to speak to everybody. And, 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 and I'm not making it up. Reverend Washington can help me testify. After the funeral is over, we are in the vestibule. And they got to separate them sometimes. Because they're fighting over who didn't do what and who didn't get what. And, and really, most of the time, it ain't that much to leave or, or, or to fight over. Because sometimes the family don't get here until they, they know that all the funeral arrangements have been made. So they don't have to pay nothing. I wish I was talking to a black church this morning. Listen, beloved. There, there, there needs to be some, some kind of way that we get all that straight like Abraham did while he lived. He gave Isaac everything he had, but he looked out for his other children and gave them gifts. And I'm sure it wasn't $18. I'm sure because Abraham was rich, and so he wanted to make sure that his death would be no confusion. Now, when someone dies, even today, when someone dies, two or three things are usually, usually come up. Uh, at the time of someone's death. Uh, when, whenever somebody dies, we want to know how did they live their life. And, and then we want to know some of the events surrounding their death. How did they die? What, what happened? What are the circumstances of their death? And then we usually want to know where they stood with the Lord. Where, what, what was their relationship with the Lord? Uh, as we consider the waning moments of the life of the father of the faithful. These aforementioned characteristics need to be found in our lives as we will soon be gathered to our people. Brothers and sisters, hear me. Soon the places that know us will know us no more. I want to give you a rather arresting statistic if the Lord Jesus delays his coming, one out of every one of us is going to die. And the questions raised this morning in Abraham's life is the questions that is raised in our lives this morning. How did you live your life? What were the circumstances surrounding your death? And what is your relationship with God? Robert Ingersoll, nicknamed the great agnostic, Standing over the grave of his brother said, life is a narrow veil lived between the cold and barren peaks of two eternity, birth and death. The philosopher Schopenhauer said that life is an endless pain with a painful end. Shakespeare said that life is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing. Paul Lawrence Dunbar said of life, it's a crust of bread and a corner to sleep in, a minute to smile and an hour to weep in, a pint of joy to a peck of trouble and never to laugh, but the moans come double and that is life. But to the children of faith, the Bible says there remaineth a rest for the people of God. 
And when life's fitful fever is ended, and when we drop this mantle of flesh and step out of the narrow circumscriptions of time into the illimitable expanses of eternity and we go home to gather with our people, we ought to look behind us to see what kind of life you lived. What were the events surrounding your death? But more importantly, what was your relationship with the Lord? Let's look at how Abraham lived his life. Brothers and sisters, his life was a life of faith. Twelve of the forty verses of Hebrews chapter 11 about, are about Abraham's faith. Read it when you get home. Hebrews chapter 11 says, by faith, Abraham. By faith, Abraham. By faith, Abraham. Twelve of 40 verses are dedicated to Abraham's faith. His was a life of faith. His entire life was marked and characterized by strong faith. What kind of life are you leading? Is your life a life of faith? And then... His life was not only a life of faith, it was a life of following. Wherever God said to go, he went. Wherever God said to stop, he stopped. Wherever God said to build an altar, he built an altar. Wherever God said to worship, he worshiped. Whatever God said to do, he did. Because faith is about following. And it's following even when you can't see what's up ahead. I wish I had help to preach right here. It's following when you don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. It's doing right when you don't know what that's going to lead to. Because right may lead to your being ostracized. You're being criticized. You're being talked about. You're being looked askance at. Right may lead to you falling out with your friends. Psalm 37 and verse 23 says the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delighteth in his way. Commit your ways unto the Lord. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. It's following God when you don't know how that's going to turn out. Many of us have no problem following when we know what the results are going to be. But I need some people here who are going to follow God no matter where it leads you. Because where he leads me, I will follow. And in following God, I may end up in some situations that I hadn't planned for. Some circumstances that, that I may not be able to get myself out of. Uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego ended up in the fiery furnace, not because they were disobeying God. They ended up in the fiery furnace because they were following God. And following God got them in a fiery furnace. But in the fiery furnace, God did not lower the temperature because the men who threw them in got killed. God just made sure that the fire wouldn't burn them. And to doubly make sure that the fire wouldn't burn them, God got in there with them. And if following God leads you to your fiery furnace, don't worry, God will fall in there too. And when you come out, the Bible says their clothes didn't even smell like fire. Because God was in there with them. Daniel didn't go to the lion's den because he was a liar or a murderer or doing anything wrong. He went in a lion's den because he was following God. But in following God, he ended up in the lion's den. And while there, God took the lion's appetite for Daniel. You missed that part. God took the lion's appetite for Daniel. I'm going to say that one more time to make it make sense. 
God took the lion's appetite for Daniel because the ones who wanted Daniel thrown in, when they put them in the lion's den, he ate them. But God took his appetite for Daniel. Fret not yourself. Wish I had one or two witnesses. Because of evildoers, nor be envious against the workers of iniquity. God will take the lion's appetite for you, but the folk who tried to throw you in going to get eaten. He'll destroy the works of the enemy. God will foil the devil in his attempts to destroy you if you follow God faithfully. The kind of life Abraham led was a life of faith. It was a life of following. It was a life of favor. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Yes. Psalm 84 and verse 11 says, No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. Yes. Favor. Favor. Uh, uh, people who are not Christian can't understand favor. Uh, the favor of God is as, as low down as you've been. He won't take his hands off you. Uh, all the mistakes you've made, you're still looking good in your 70s. All the stuff that went on in your life that ordinarily would have took other people out, you still standing. He'll keep you till your hair turns gray. He'll carry you when it looks like you can't go another step. He'll provide for you and give you what you need right when you need it. That's called favor. You're not doing good on your job because you're such a good employee. That's divine favor. Because some folk are smarter than you who don't have a job. God just decided to show you favor. I know I'm favored. Because there's nothing in my history there's nothing in my background that says I ought to be where I am right now. I know what the favor of God looks like because you're looking at God's favor right now. Somebody sitting next to you ought to go on and testify. You are looking at the favor of God. When you look at me, you're looking at somebody God has favored. You can tell folk who've been favored they don't mind giving God praise for favor. He walks with me. He talks with me. He tells me I'm his own. Favor. Favor. I'm trying to leave that alone, but favor. There's folk looking at you wondering how you still shouting. Favor. All the lies they've told about you and you still going on. Favor. You had cancer, but you look like you ain't been sick a day. Favor. You are without a job for a whole year and never missed a meal. Favor. Your enemies thought you were finished after you were divorced, but here you are better than ever. You were not divorced, you were delivered. Favor! He looked beyond my faults and saw my need. Somebody here should have been dead. 
but the favor of God got you still looking good, still riding good, still living good. It's not because you've been good, it's because God's been good. Not because I've been so faithful. Not because I've always obeyed. Not because I've trusted him to be with me all of the way. But because he loves me so dearly. I wish I had a witness here. I need somebody who know you've been favored and your life is a life of favor. You are living in the sunshine of God's favor and you're not embarrassed to let somebody know God favored me. Here it is. Here it is. It's just this simple. I wish I had something more profound. I wish I had something deeper. But it's just this simple. Jesus loves me. This I know because the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Somebody ought to help me shout over that. When I'm unlovable, Jesus loves me. When I'm unworthy, Jesus loves me. When I'm not good enough, Jesus loves me. When I've sinned, Jesus loves me. Yeah. That's how he lived his life. But now I want to move on to how he died his death. He lived his life in in faith, in following, in favor. But let's look at the events surrounding his death. Not only is Abraham an excellent example of how we ought to live our lives, but even in his dying, there are some precious truths that are seen in him that ought to be seen in us. Let's, let's, let's look at the readiness of his death. Uh, no struggle. Not, not trying to hold on to stuff. Not hating that he got to go. He's lived 175 years. God's been good to him. Everything life had to offer, God blessed him with. And so when it came time to die, he gave up the ghost. He breathed his last. No, 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 no struggle, not trying to, not trying to grab a refrigerator. Not, not trying to hold on to a car. Not, not, not putting his money under the mattress. Not, not making sure that he got his bank book in his hand. Because if your heart strings are tied to your checkbook, you're going to have a hard time leaving here. If what you have and what you own is who you are, you're going to struggle to die. You ought to hold everything with a loose grip. Because one day, God will take you from it or it from you. Don't, 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 don't hold these things where, where moth can corrupt them. Thieves can break through and steal them. Uh, 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 build treasures in heaven where moth cannot corrupt and thieves cannot break through and steal. These, these things that we have 
These, these things that God gives us is for us to use. Uh, use your things. Don't fall in love with your things. Don't get caught up in your things. Don't identify with your things because when it's time to die, I just want to breathe my last. I thank the Lord that I was in the room when my father breathed his last. I watched him take his last breath. I was there when my mother took her last breath. I was there to watch three of my brothers take their last breath. No strain, no, no fighting, no struggling, no trying to stay here. Listen, when it's time to go, go. And, 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 and maybe there's something wrong with me. Maybe, maybe I'm messed up in my thinking. I'm, I'm, and, and it could very well be me. But I don't understand people who, who are want to hold on to people and keep them here with cancer. Ravaging their bodies. They, they can't control their bodily functions. They no longer know who, who they are, where they are. You want them to stay here like that forever? No, you ought to pray for them to go. Because this world is not our home. We are pilgrims and strangers and when it's time for us to leave this world, you think I want to stay here old forever? Can't see? Can't walk? Can't dress myself? I want to go! People hollering at you. Telling you, open your mouth. Y'all ain't going to be hollering at me. I'm gone. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not staying here uh, wetting myself and uh, people pointing at you. I want to go. I, because listen, brothers and sisters, I am not in love with this world. Abraham said, I'm looking for a city. I wish I had a Bible reader. Whose builder and maker is God. I'm a pilgrim. I'm a stranger. I'm, I'm leaving this world. I, I'm going to trade the temporary for the eternal. I'm going to trade the land of the dying for the land of the living. I'm going to trade time for eternity. Departure for an entrance. Because when this life is over, it's over. Paul said, I'm now ready to be offered. The time of my departure is at hand. I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I've kept the faith. Henceforth there's a crown waiting on me. And not only me but to all those also who love his appearing. Uh, brothers and sisters, uh, the readiness of his death uh, helps us to see the reassurance of his death. I want you to get this. I, I want you to get this because I worked on this a while. You're going to have to pay me for this because I worked on this a long time. Abraham is looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. Abraham dies and he's buried along with Sarah in a field that he brought, that he bought from the Hittites. But when Abraham dies, he dies looking for what he has faith in. He has not seen it, but he died in faith, trusting in it, come on, come on, come on. looking for it. Yeah. And when he dies, he does not go immediately 
to what he's been promised. He goes to a place called Gehenna or paradise. And he's in paradise believing that the promise is coming. Somebody ought to help me preach here. He has not seen it yet. But he's trusting that the promise will be fulfilled. So he dies and he goes to paradise. Waiting on God to make real the promise. Stay with me. One Friday, Jesus dies on the cross. And they bury his body and put him in Joseph of Arimathea's new tomb. But Jesus is still ministering in the grave. Because First Peter tells us that he went to paradise to preach to the spirits that had been chained in darkness. They had been looking for Messiah, but they never saw him, but they died believing. So Jesus, when he dies, goes to where they are in paradise to give them something to look forward to. But we Christians don't have something to look forward to. We got something to look back with that. Because what Abraham was looking forward to, you and I are looking backwards at. What Abraham was looking for, you and I are looking backwards at. Let me make that make sense. The death of Jesus Christ on the cross was good news forward for those who were in paradise. But for those of us who are in Lily Grove this morning, we are not looking for salvation. We are shouting from salvation we are not looking for eternal life we already started I still don't think I got that over to you we are not looking for heaven and the presence of God we already have it in the presence of the Holy Spirit and if you can't enjoy God now you're going to have a hard time when you get to heaven. If you can't shout and praise God now, I feel sorry for you when it's really time to start shouting and praising God. If you can't make noise right now or don't like to be around people who make noise, I don't know where you're going. Because if you go to hell, it's going to be noisy. Because in hell, the Bible says there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. The worm never dies and the screams are always heard. But if you go to heaven, it's sure enough going to be noisy. Because four and twenty elders are around the throne day and night shouting his praises. And if by chance they should hush, I wish I had a witness here. Thousands and ten thousands of angels are shouting blessings and glory, wisdom and power. And if by chance they should hush, thousands and ten thousands of other angels will join in the number. And if by chance they should hush, some of us are going to be there lifting up antiphonal praise to God forever. Where is the Lamb? Hallelujah! The Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Thank you! I think I ought to remind somebody that the carrying on we do over here is a dress rehearsal. You get in practice here for giving God praise. And the only way you can die right is to live right. And, and, and when you live right, the circumstances of your death, no matter what they are, 
has everything to do with your relationship with the Lord. His, his relationship with the Lord, I, I don't want to leave this out. His love was on display. Come on, come on. Listen, beloved. Genuine love for God, genuine love for God manifests itself in obedience. Genuine love for God manifests itself in obedience. I don't care how much you say you love God. If you don't obey God, you like him, but you don't love him. Somebody ought to help me close here. I don't care how much of a Christian you call yourself. Jesus said, why call me master and don't do the things that I say? Genuine love for God is, is fleshed out in obedience. If you love God, you're a tither. If you love God, you're an encourager. If you love God, you don't walk around with a chip on your shoulder and, and waiting for somebody to say something you don't like so you can give them a piece of your mind. Love is patient. Love is kind. It's not puffed up. It's not easily provoked. It does not seek its own way. It does not rejoice in iniquity. It rejoices in the truth. It bears all things. It hopes all things. It endures all things. Love never fails. closest love we can come to of the love of God is the love that a parent has for his child. Particularly a mother's love. That mama might agree with that daddy that that boy ain't no good, we got to put him out. Mama will agree and say, uh-uh, you gone. Your daddy say you out, you out. And he'll call his mama and say, mama, I'm hungry. And she will not sneak food out the house. She'll go cook it. She ain't going to sneak no money out the account. She going to go take it out. Because that's my child. Or he'll call and say, Mama, I'm in jail. The daddy say, that's where you ought to stay. But Mama say, we getting up and going to get that boy out of jail. Because love never gives up. That's what that word fails in the text means. It never gives up. I know he ain't no good. But he's mine. I know he doesn't deserve another chance but he's mine. I wish I had a witness here. Because when you look at it like that, take it up 10 billion times. God looks at us when we are no good and say, I know he's wrong but he's mine. I know he doesn't deserve another chance but I died for him on the cross his love is genuine mistakes warts falls failure but he has a genuine love for God and then brothers and sisters finally not only was his love displayed, but his love was declared. But I want you to hear me. Abraham is held in esteem by the three great monotheistic faiths of the world. Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Each of these religions, major religions of the world, 
hold Abraham in the highest esteem as the father of the faithful. He is so revered in Judaism that he's almost in the place of God. He is revered by the Muslim faith. He's revered by the Christian faith. Abraham is known as the father of the faithful. But read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and Abraham himself never mentions a word about his faith. He never calls himself faithful. Jehoshaphat said it. God himself said it. Jesus said it. Twelve verses of Hebrews 11 is dedicated to it. But Abraham never said it himself. Because when you are truly, genuinely, authentically faithful, other people see it. But more than that, God sees it. It's not in your talk, it's in your walk. He walked by faith. He didn't talk by faith. Because all many of us talk a good game. But when darkness comes, you got to walk by faith. When sickness comes, you got to walk by faith. When trouble comes, you got to walk by faith. When trials grip your family, you got to walk by faith. We walk by faith and not by sight. We cannot see in the future. We cannot see through dark clouds. We cannot see through sorrow and teardrops, but we walk on by faith each day. On Monday, by faith. Even on Tuesday, by faith. Let Jesus be your guide. Because he's able to carry the load. For he can see way down the road. Walk on by faith each day. I, I don't know how long I'm going to live. But I do know I'm going to live by my faith. My next step may be my last. But if it's my last step, it'll be the last step I take by faith. I trust God with my future. I trust God with my finances. I trust God with my family. I trust God foundationally to carry me through. 